for joining us. This meeting is being recorded. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. We really appreciate your support and interest in participating in our lecture series. My name is Michelle Malady young and I'm a board member with Gateway Center of Excellence in Rural Health. Gateway is located in Goddard, Ontario, and to our knowledge, the, is the only rural health center in Canada governed by community-based volunteers. Partnered with several academic centers and healthcare facilities, our mission is to improve the health and quality of life of rural residents through research, education, and communication. In 2020, Gateway launched this virtual lecture series with social isolation being top of mind as COVID-19 restrictions continued to heighten. There was no better time to launch this initiative. Through this lecture series, we hope to promote a culture of rural health knowledge and, and innovation while virtually connecting individuals and communities to help reduce this social isolation. Today's presentation is entitled, Enhancing the Resilience of Our community, Rural Communities, Moving Knowledge into Practice. Our speaker today is Sheila Schulein, Gateway's Chair of Rural Health Coaching. Sheila created an effective outreach model called the Lonely No More program, which since 2018 has engaged participants in elder circles or weekly chats occurring in a party line fashion with three to five rural older adults. The sessions are facilitated by a trained community volunteer. And joining Sheila today is Sarah Versteeg, Program Coordinator of Lonely No More and Connectedness Coaching Co-Developer. Since its inception in 2020, Connectedness Coaching has provided valuable educational opportunities such as webinars, uh, as well as, um, and, and they are aimed at building resilience in our communities at both the organization and the personal level. Sheila and Sarah will highlight in greater detail these two successful and locally conducted examples of transforming research into community-based action, Lonely No More program and Connectedness Coaching. We're pleased to welcome two panelists, Sarah today, Todd Kassenberg, a Connectedness Coaching graduate, has been a part of Lonely No More's leadership volunteer team since 2021 and is the mayor of the municipality of North Perth. Christina Wild, also a Connectedness Coaching graduate, has been a part of Lonely No More's leadership volunteer team since 2020. Currently, Christina is serving as navigator for Huron Shores United Church. So as we proceed through today's presentation, please enter any of your questions you've got into our Q&A feature, and we'll do our best to address your welcomed questions. So Sheila, I am now going to pass this over to you and I will see you back in a bit. Thanks, Michelle, for that uh, warm introduction. Uh, Sarah is actually gonna be starting us off with our land acknowledgement. Awesome, Sarah here. Um, we want to start off by acknowledging that we gather on traditional territory of a number of First Nations and acknowledge their stewardship of this land throughout the ages. We seek a new relationship with the original peoples of this land, one that is based on honor and deep respect. This is our agenda. We plan to explore how um, our community has used evidence-based programming to navigate and negotiate for their needs in meaningful ways. And we would like to use the Knowledge to Action Framework to present our programs, our Lonely No More, and our Connectedness Coaching programs, and their impact the programs have had on our rural region. What is this Knowledge to Action Framework I speak of? Well, it's a structural approach for making positive change. It includes an, an action phase that moves knowledge learned into practice. The Knowledge to Action Framework was developed in Canada by Graham and colleagues in 2000s, and the framework has two distinct uh, and related components. The knowledge creation, which is represented by the funnel in the middle, and it's surrounded by the action cycle. The action cycle outlines a process representing activities needed for the knowledge to be applied into practice. Knowledge is adapted to the local context. Barriers and facilitators that enable its use are explicitly assessed, and the knowledge and involvement of stakeholders and tailoring that knowledge to the needs of those that are going to use this 
is a crucial step of that process. We'll be starting off with identifying our core problem, which is the bottom box in the circle. Sheila, over to you. Thanks, Sarah. So identifying the problem, first click, Sarah. It really is the loneliness epidemic. Um, you know, we're more familiar with it now since the pandemic. Uh, and, you know, I'd say, I dare say that rural seniors are still not, you know, fully engaging in community as they were before that, um, before the pandemic. But rural seniors really are at an increased risk. And we could talk a little bit about that uh, as we go forward. One out of every three seniors are socially isolated. I'm not sure if that's a surprise to you. That's 2016 data from the National Seniors Council. Next click, Sarah. What does that mean? Why is this an important issue? Um, you know, we know that social isolation has devastating health effects. And for older adults, um, these are just some of them. This is in no way an exhaustive list. Uh, increase the risk of dementia by 60%. It's associated with depression, anxiety, and high blood pressure. And that's across the lifespan, but also for older adults. Of course, can lead to sickness, injury, and even death. Generally, you know, it weakens our community. We lose the wisdom and the engagement of, of older adults to our detriment. Next slide, please, sir. I do kind of wanna mention that um, there's a bit of a difference here. Uh, lonely isolation really describes the situation of not having people around. Loneliness describes a feeling. So it's kind of important to understand the difference. Um, loneliness is that mismatch between the relationships a person has compared to the relationships they want. So what we're looking at here is an Angus Reid study that came out in 2019, and it's the Index on Loneliness and Social Isolation. Now this again is across the lifespan, um, and they do have some specifics around older adults. So you know, older adults, um, and they're looking at that as 55 plus, uh, they're either, you know, they fall into the cherished groups, and that cherished group are mostly married and have children and have higher incomes. And then those um, who are 55 years and older who are under that 50K are usually twice as likely to be among the desolate as those with incomes of 100K or more. So there are some um, environmental factors that, that also inf influence this problem. Next slide, Sarah. Um, that that um, data that I showed showed you from the Angus Reid poll uh, was 2019, but there is a huge area of research uh, that came na out nationally from this National Seniors Council, the report on social isolation of seniors. That came out in 2013, and if you want to do a deeper dive on this topic, uh, I certainly suggest you you take a Google for that. Um, the more recent data collected as part of the index notes that those 55 plus often report difficulties dealing with social isolation as they become removed from friends and family after moves or the loss of loved ones. Uh, this alongside potential mobility challenges and transportation limitations, often you know, exacerbated in, uh, in rural regions, may increase isolation among the aged and are considerably more likely to, be, uh, to report being isolated. But they don't always say they're lonely. That is, they may not feel lonely, but they have less positive interaction and contact with other younger people. So um, this is kind of uh, building off of that fact uh, and, and a little bit more local information. In Southwestern Ontario, older adults over 65 make up a significant portion of our neighboring you know, rural communities. And in Southwestern Ontario, the elderly dependency ratio which is the number of older adults who may, dependent, may be dependent on working age individuals, is approximately 6% higher in our southwestern region, southwestern Ontario region, as compared to the national figure. So that means we're coming in at about 30% of older adults, 65 plus, who are relying on working age individuals. Next slide. So if we say that, there's a definitely a reason to do, uh, to do some outreach interventions. Because if there's 30% of older adults dependent on working age individuals, those working age individuals are most often you know, part of the sandwich generation. So it really isn't surprising that the number uh, and quality of social interactions 
provided for older rural adults is a concern that needs to be addressed. So I know this is a crazy busy slide. I, I will um, kind of walk you through it briefly. I wanted to show it to you uh, in case you are interested in learning more about us. And of course, we hope you are. Uh, this will be on our website. Um, and it gives you a bit more of a history and some of the things we've done. So it, as uh, Michelle kind of told you at the start, it is a peer support program designed to enhance well-being uh, through co-facilitating co -facilitating new networks and enabling improved community engagement. So we um, have our peers or community volunteers uh, learn about appreciative inquiry and how to have conversations that focus on um, strengths. And we also train uh, the volunteers to understand resource navigation because some of them are um, uh, interested and able to do one-on-ones uh, if we note red flags within, within the program, if an older adult needs a little bit of extra support. So history, briefly, 2018, um, uh, I developed this in partnership with the University of Waterloo School of Pharmacy uh, as a pilot project. So we, um, at that point, engaged 57 folks, uh, volunteers and, and participants to try to offer it in four in four counties, Grey, Bruce, Perth, and Huron. Uh, shortly after the pilot, we realized that there was a definite need for this and um, we didn't want it to end there. So we rolled it into more of a community support service. Uh, since that time, it's been going, going strong. I must tell you that we have uh, participants who started with us back in 2018 who continue to, till day, to today. So that speaks to, that's a testament to the value that, that these older adults are gaining from the program. They've developed new networks of support within the program, and um, that was the ultimate goal. Um, we have done, a, I'm not gonna spend too much time telling you about some of the tailoring that we've done. You'll see it come up in other slides. And we have Christina here, who's gonna talk about that because she's led some of our learn and try initiatives. Um, we are just in the process of starting on a new grant uh, the Ally Project, which is kind of harnessing lived experience. We really recognize that across, I, I, at least across Canada, there's a true challenge in recruiting volunteers, and that's the mainstay of our program. Uh, so we are looking at using this new, this new funding to be able to um, recruit additional volunteers and look at harnessing some of the lived experience that we have from from our volunteers as, as we move forward. Next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, in 2020, we were approached by um, Todd Kassenberg, um, the mayor of North Perth, to collaborate and bring Lonely No More program uh, to the older adults in their community. Uh, we worked hard on trying to figure out a way to do that, and we struck a very, what I think is a, a very innovative, kind of sustainable, formal fee-for-service agreement so that we can deliver that um, in, in the municipality of North Perth. And he's joining us today, so he'll be able to tell us more about that. The second slide uh, brings, brings to light the training program that we developed for our volunteers, and both Todd and Christina have gone through this program. Uh, it has morphed a lot as well, because we are continually evaluating and continually taking those evaluations to make the product um, uh, better suit our learners. So through appreciative inquiry and promoting meaningful engagement in the larger community, connectedness coaching empowers community members and organizations to explore and enhance the resilience. So uh, we first launched, we first rolled out our first connectedness coaching in 2021. We developed, we used 2020 to develop it. And the funding that we received uh, was geared, was requested to make sure that not only did we use it as a first level training for our volunteers, but we also attempted to keep open that, um, that training so that any community member could take it, believing like we did with the previous, uh, the old version or the in-person version of uh, our training. We believe that anybody who gets these skills or learns these skills or just renews these skills are going to be better community members, be able to better engage. So uh, we've always kept our, community, our, our connectedness coaching open to community members. And from there, we, uh, we take the volunteers and they go into a second level training, specifically around program process and, and how, to, how to manage the Lonely No More program. In a moment, you'll get to see some of the content we cover. 
Uh, but as Michelle also said, we have uh, Uh, is Pila frozen for everybody else? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, I have one of the challenges of uh, rural internet, right? I'm sure we're all familiar. Uh, Sarah, are you comfortable to take over the presentation from this point? Yeah, we'll that's not a problem. Okay. Absolutely. And she can jump in whenever her internet decides to come back to us. That's not a problem. Um, so um, just picking off where she left off, um, we also um, have been able to adapt connectedness coaching to our local context in many different ways. So for example, we've been able to team up with um, uh, local agencies that work with newcomers and being able to adapt connectedness coaching to better suit their needs as well as um, their goals to address um, uh, the na navigating and negotiating uh, for the needs of their clients in many different ways. Um, let's go to the next slide here. Um, there was a number of barriers, um, as Shayla mentioned, um, uh, between um, COVID, between, um, uh, let me just pick up her, her notes here. Here we go. Um, as Shayla mentioned, Connectus Coaching has gone through several iterations to overcome identified barriers um, through our evaluations collected from knowledge users. Um, that includes breaking content into easy to digest chunks, uh, moving from in-person to um, online due to COVID, um, as well as working with clear language specialists to synthesize our content, um, to be able to um, uh, have a big range of, uh, of literacy levels engaged as well. Uh, we also use a strength-based approach, matching low and high digital literacy um, volunteers together to be able to use the strengths that they're coming with to enhance their time in the program. And we've certainly received a very positive feedback from those that have participated in Connectness Coaching. And we continue to explore ways to ensure that knowledge is transferred, is, is valued, and hopefully applied in the community in many different ways, in addition to our Lonely Network program. We've always opened up our volunteer education to anyone who's interested in learning, um, even if they don't want to sign up as a Lonely Noir volunteer. Uh, we believe that anyone who experiences Connectness Coaching will hopefully be inspired to give back to our community. Um, there's many different topics and knowledge um, uh, sort of modules um, that we explore. And you can see from our diagram here, it's Right now, its current iteration is a four webinar workshop series. Um, and it starts with, um, very similar to this framework, it starts with a problem. Um, the idea of trying to create connection to resolve community's needs and working through and um, uh, building skills and knowledge that are needed to serve the community in effective ways. We've also tailored our Lonely Noir outreach to express the needs of our participants and community. Um, one of our panelists, Christina, who's here today, was a key facilitator in several of these um, innovations, and we'll, we'll learn a little bit more about that during our panel discussion. Some examples include our Friday music jams. Um, they have they started in a, in 2021 and have continued on, um, and it's been a really awesome way to provide participants ways to informally step up and be leaders in their community. Um, the music group was created based on uh, a needs needs that were expressed during COVID about this idea of wanting to give back to the community in some way that is safe. Um, that uses the skills that they have. So that's been a very effective way of doing that. Um, this is just one of our um, Connectus Coaching Community customizations. Um, most recently, we were asked by Enliven Cancer Care in Muskoka to customize the education for their community, which included those living with cancer, survivors and caregivers, um, as well as the general public. Um, they were looking for an education model that would provide resilience tools as well as help them recruit new volunteers to expand their programming. According to the evaluations we have received, um, we were quite successful on both of those accounts, so it's been very encouraging to see. So looking at that roadmap again, we 
been able to share knowledge with the community through connectedness coaching and our lonely more specific educations um, with many different learning objectives uh, with each of these topics. Um, this diagram shows how we've monitored those learning objectives and newly sharpened skills in various ways in the context of Lonely No More. Uh, we use a weekly activity log. Uh, we monitor through one-on-one -on -one reports. Um, and uh, we're able to gauge those competencies among volunteers. Um, and we also ensure community-based knowledge that's requested by participants in the program, older adults that are wanting additional um, knowledge and support. Uh, we monitor those through our outreach initiatives, such as our grief, grief event and coping exchange. Uh, so it's been very meaningful. We also monitor knowledge use in informal ways. So, through contests, social media, and relationships with our Connectness Coaching graduates. Um, it's been amazing to see how one small moment of connection makes a huge difference. How do we know that we're making a difference? Well, we use a mixed method approach to evaluate key outcomes, such as things like program satisfaction, volunteer retention, um, engagement of participants. Our main goal is to capture the experience of and impact on engaged um, older adults from our region. On the slide here are a few examples of how we've done that. The top graph there on the, on the top left is an example of um, our average rankings provided by three different Connectness Coaching cohorts. Um, and we've captured that through post webinar surveys. Uh, the bottom quote here is um, some positive feedback we received through one-on-one -on -one interviews um, at the end of an outreach initiative that Christina is actually gonna tell us more about when we get to the question and answer period. Other examples um, include our eight week follow-up survey um, with Connect Coaching Learners. Um, we found that 58% of learners reported that they were able to apply the content that they learned through Connectness Coaching to others in their community eight weeks post-education. One of my favorite examples is piloting Connectness Coaching with a few graduate and undergraduate students at the University of Waterloo. We were able to provide them access to our e-learning iteration of Connectness Coaching and did a pre and post um, focus group um, with them. During one of those focus groups, two of the um, students actually said they were so inspired with the knowledge that they had learned through the course that they actually started up their own pen pal initiative um, to encourage connections with their local long-term home residents. Last but not least, due to the duration of some of our participants in the program, we've actually been able to start mapping out their journey from uh, being isolated to becoming agents of change in their community. This figure is actually based on a real journey of one of our Lonely Mar participants. So I'll kind of walk through uh, their journey with you today. It started with Derek, who is a Huron librarian. He ended up placing a postcard for our Lonely Mar program into her book order, knowing that Jill has a hard time um, in the winter months to get out and about. Um, after chatting with Jill, I was able to kind of see what her goals were around connection. Um, and she wanted to um, connect with others through music, through some of the talents she had. We were able to get her connected to the music group. And after hearing uh, from our musicians um, about these weekly group chats, uh, Jill ended up uh, expressing that she would love to join that. So working with um, the volunteer that um, that facilitates the music group, as well as myself, we were able to get her into a, an elder circle um, that really suited her personality as well as her schedule. Um, once she got going in the elder circle groups, uh, during one of the call, Taylor, her um, uh, co-facilitator of the elder circle, um, noticed that Jill was really down um, after one of the calls. Um, she seemed very withdrawn um, and not her usual jovial self. Um, so as part of the program, um, Taylor reached out and said, Jill, do you want to have a one-on-one? -on -one? I'm happy to kind of check in with you. Um, and uh, Jill actually shared with Taylor in this one-on-one -on -one setting that um, um, she had a visit with her grandson. And during that visit, she had an argument. Um, he does struggle with ADHD. So he, um, when he got upset, he, he ended up being um, a bit more violent um, than she was expecting. And she actually fell to the ground. Um, 
So um, talking with Taylor, she expressed that, you know, I don't know what, what to do if this ever happened again. How would I be able to keep myself safe? What do I do to support my grandson? Um, so working with, with Taylor, um, they were able to figure out that, you know what, Taylor's maybe not the best fit for this. Um, Taylor felt like it was a little bit out of her scope of expertise. So we were able to get her connected to Sheila, our health coach for the program. Um, after meeting with, with Sheila, Joe was able to make a safety plan um, that included some action steps she could do um, when her grandson is upset to keep herself safe, but also support him in a way that is um, that is helpful. Um, Sheila was also able to, uh, to talk to her and share some community resources um, around that as well. So she was able to get connected to the Huron uh, Perth Helpline and the Crisis Response Team um, as part of our safety plan. Um, working with Jill uh, to address her goals of finding safe ways to support her grandson, Taylor, her Elder Circle uh, facilitator, was actually able to uh, help her harness some skills on her tablet so that she can look at educational videos and webinars on ADHD to better understand her grandson. Through those skills that we had built together, uh, she was able to connect to the music group using her tablet now. And she was so excited about it that she actually regularly invites um, her neighbors and her neighbor's kids to join in and do some sing-alongs um, on her tablet. So it's been awesome to see. And through those sing-alongs, um, uh, Jill was able to connect with other, um, uh, one particular isolated um, a neighbor of hers. And we were able to get that neighbor into the program um, and started a new circle of connection in her community. So through this process, Jill is now uh, being able to be an advocate for those that are isolated in her community and finding ways to be a positive um, agent of change. Well, how are we sustaining these connections of new circles of support? Um, well, we've been doing it through grant funding to sustain that knowledge use community partnerships, local partnerships, as well as community investment. Um, and we wanna of course thank everyone who's, who's been contributing to the program over the years and making the impact that we're having in our community very possible. But we don't wanna stop there. We wanna team up with you as audience members, as residents of our community um, to be able to um, take some action together. Uh, there's many different ways you can contribute to our knowledge to action framework. Um, you can capitalize on your lived experience um, and provide your thoughts and feedback on our next round of educational training happening in the fall. Um, you can become a volunteer. You could sponsor a volunteer or a participant. Um, and you can also help spread that word. Be the Derek that kind of promotes Lonely No More to those in the, in the community who are more isolated, who really do need um, a safe way of connecting with others. Um, you can also take a moment with us now um, and to complete our evaluation poll. Um, we'd love to get your feedback. Um, before we move into our Q&A, and I know Sheila's just popped on now, so awesome. Um, fantastic. Um, so while we're just taking um, um, some action together on the poll, Jay, if you wouldn't mind setting that up for us, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Um, let's give everyone a moment to, to take action, to actually help us move this knowledge um, into action in our community, into practice. Um, we'll give everyone maybe a minute to answer the poll and we'll get uh, Sheila ready to ask our panelists questions. So we'll give everyone just one moment here and then we'll continue to our next phase of the presentation. And welcome back, Sheila. I know that we all struggle with uh, the challenges of rural internet and connections, but um, glad to see you back. Thank you. I'm glad I made it back. Yes, we're, we're all internet. Mm, what can I say? Well, thank you all for helping us move knowledge to action. Um, our first panelist question is for Christina. As a volunteer who led several of our listen, learn, and tries, um, such as the slot program and our storytelling club, 
Can you please share how these customized outreach programs were modified to better suit your uh, the needs and desires of participants and our Lonely No More program? Thanks, Sarah. Uh, very pleased to be here and share my experience. Um, First of all, I'll just explain to everyone that SLOT stands for Stretch, Lift, or Tap, if you didn't see that in the lovely Sarah's lovely graphic. Um, so you might ask yourself when you hear that, how do we conduct a mobility exercise program um, within the constraints of COVID and um, all the barriers to participation that Sarah talked about? And um, because we had an opportunity to do this program, uh, we really had to put our thinking caps together, volunteers and staff alike, and uh, we came up uh, with a way to engage participants um, for all, and I'm going to say 11 sessions, if I remember correctly, uh, weekly sessions. Um, uh, and, and just for those of you who are listening, um, of course, we did this program um, we could have done this program completely over Zoom, which would have uh, which would have given us a, a an easy way to um, explain some of the movements of SLOT. But we knew that would leave out um, many isolated seniors who um, don't have access to a computer or don't have the t um, technology background. Um, so we actually um, used our teleconferencing system that. Um, that's used for Lonely No More. And we uh, called in the participants of each class. Um, sometimes we had up to nine people in the class, so um, it was great. Um, but the big modification to the program was um, to give it a storytelling lilt. And by that, I mean, we created stories as facilitators to share with participants that would incorporate all the movements that we had just learned um, through the SLOT guidelines. And it was so exciting because it gave us as volunteers an opportunity to write some great stories, to pen some stories. Um, but it was just so unique in our way of thinking and our experience with exercise and fitness programs in the past. Um, it just really took off uh, in, with great guns. People were very excited about it. We got immediately wonderful feedback. Um, and, and I personally loved it because I, I'm a, I like to tell stories. So it was a great, uh, and so was my partner and the, my part, my uh, co-facilitator. But then the, the, um, a new iteration came throughout the program, uh, about halfway through the program when some of our participants wanted to tell a story of their own. And um, I'll just take a step back and say that um, we'd had a little bit of experience at that point in our Storytellers Club, which is another program, another um, offshoot program from Lonely No More, um, where we have uh, professional storytellers come in and share their stories. So we were also at a point where some of our participants in SLOT had had that experience and people were starting to pen their own stories to share in the weekly um, conversations. So uh, it was just so Exciting. And I've heard throughout this presentation the word inspire and inspiration used. And I'll say for volunteers and for participants alike, it was truly an inspirational time. Thank you very much, Christina. Uh, Sheila, I think you have the next panelist question. I do. I'm going to ask Todd a question. Todd, you've also been a longtime volunteer with Lonely No More. And it's over two years now that you've been with us. So thank you. Formal well, thank you. Um, could you please share some of your experiences and the impact the program has had on your residents, uh, at least from what you know about that? Well, thank you, Sheila, and a pleasure as well to be here today. Um, you know, uh, Christina has sort of set the stage, and she and I, of course, have worked together in, in a group over the period of uh, my involvement with the program. She talked about storytelling, and, and the program creates this wonderful opportunity for people to connect with each other through their stories. Um, it... Um, my approach to this perhaps is uh, unique, I, I suppose. Um, each facilitator of the program has their sort of own style or, uh, you know, approach to the, the uh, discussions. And, and I use a lot of planned interaction prompts. I'll, I'll create interesting questions that get people to talk about their lived experience and about their preferences in life. It has created a lot of laughs and laughing is good. 
and it has created a lot of positive vibes in the group, um, which uh, generally uh, spill over into uh, their next part of their week and so forth. So um, we've had a lot of fun and a lot of pleasure learning about each other. Um, I think about the the fact that um, uh, the program actually allows expression and voice from some who who often don't uh, engage in that way. We have one gentleman who is actually quite socially shy and awkward, and um, he certainly has come out of his shell. And, and uh, as we get him talking about his passions and hobbies, um, he's just a, a chatterbox, actually. He becomes very engaged and, and, um, and, and shares what he knows with others. So I think that, that, that allowing him the ability to express express himself isn't something that's common in his daily life and uh, he's getting the benefit of the program to that end. Um, certainly uh, the program has allowed um, a lot of troubleshooting and sort of resource navigation. Um, you know, there are multiple people in the group who've had personal issues and, um, and sometimes even delicate ones, probably ones that we would rather not uh, get too deeply involved with, but uh, through the, um, you know, appropriate questioning and inquiry, and um, and laying out some of the resources that can be available. Some some people have found solutions to what were quite uh, uh, difficult problems in their lives. Um, one lady in one group was having quite a series of challenges with her banking institution, and and it, it, it took quite a while for her to sort of get herself sorted out with her bank. But uh, the group you know, inquired and, and I worked a little bit with her and Christina, I think worked a little bit with her on, on some of that to try to, to um, let her sort through the facts and, and, and make good decisions. Um, we certainly work to connect people with uh, good resources. We have one lady in our group who has been in and out of, of chronic illness and, um, and, Certainly, we've worked to try to um, help her understand how to better utilize uh, the healthcare system. And uh, I think there's been some progress there. Um, we there's there's an interesting uh, you know uh, the obvious one of the obvious outcomes is there's a, a sort of a sense of wellness I think that has come through participation in the group. Uh, people look forward to it. They express that clearly. And uh, even on a cloudy day, and it's quite interesting, I'll note that uh, cloudy days are not usually good days uh, in the group because people are a little bit blue or a little bit uh, uh, frustrated. Um, but once they get together and start talking, there's a, a you know, renewed sense of wellness. Um, the, 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 you know, two more points, I think that um, we learn about and stoke people's passions. Some of it's in the past, in their histories, and, and they're just appreciatively looking back and reflecting on their passions, uh, which is wonderful. We have one lady who used to be um, very passionate about hats in the 1950s and 60s, and, um, and uh, she likes to talk about that. And, um, and then we have another gentleman in my group, and I know that she spills over into, or he spills over into the music project, um, but he'll play and sing for us probably one out of two or one out of three group sessions. So, um, you know, some of the passions are, are allowed and facilitated. Uh, finally, we, um, I think, are supporting in some ways um, those who are in the earliest stages of dementia. And, um, and so um, the group becomes quite tolerant with those people. And, um, and we help those people work through some of their um, thoughts, some of which are unstructured at times, but uh, um, generally uh, give them good, pleasant feelings about their reflections on, on things in their lives. So there's just this amazing range of, of um, benefits and opportunities that come uh, through the program. And uh, I, I still remain amazed and at times frustrated, but mostly amazed. <laughs> Thank you very much for sharing, uh, Todd. I appreciate that. Uh, going back to Christina, um, you've recently taken on a position as navigator uh, for the Huron Church Shores United Church in Grand Bend. Um, you mentioned that Connectness Coaching was instrumental in readying you for that role. Could you share a little bit more about that? Absolutely. Um, I'm a fundraiser by trade. I've been doing that work for about 30 years now. And um, there are certain skills you pick up along the way. And I, I really 
was thinking about exploring other career opportunities, using those skills in different ways. And then um, I was very blessed to take part in the Connectness Coaching Program. Um, I just saw a world of possibilities, um, not only for uh, the people uh, that I was helping through my volunteer roles with Women No More, but also for myself and for my daily interactions. It just opened up a whole new way of thinking. You know, we hear the term mindfulness all the time, but in every sense of the word, um, you finish the program and you just have a whole different um, way of looking at the world. Um, so I, I uh, built a little bit more resiliency in myself in the people that I was helping. And I gained, of course, that leads to a little bit more empowerment, a little bit more confidence, and also just the the pure, um, oh, just the pure inspiration of the skills. You know, Todd talked about uh, appreciative inquiry. And, you know, you just, you start to ask the kinds of questions for yourself and for others um, that lead to a whole new way of thinking. Um, Todd, you talked about reflections and how those have made such an impact on us as volunteers and, and as um, with the clients for each other. And uh, during our storytelling time, someone said, um, when reflections are in your head, they're your memories. But when you learn and feel comfortable and feel empowered to say them out loud, they become your stories. And then they create a unique connection with others. And so I've kind of changed my way of thinking about the world and um, using those. So long story short, um, the very first thing I did uh, with my newfound confidence was to lead an empowering resilience workshop in the community. Um, just absolutely uh, love doing that and, and could see my skills blossom a little bit more as it would take the practical um, skills from connecting this coaching and use them in each and every workshop. So that was great. And then most recently, I've just accepted a position in my own community, which I really stress that because um, I've worked internationally and nationally my whole life, uh, mostly from home. And this has just been an opportunity to get out into my own community as well. Um, so I am now a community wellness programs coordinator for South Huron United Church. And uh, with the goal of reducing isolation for seniors and other populations in our community. So very excited about that. I don't think I could have brought the wealth of information to uh, an experience to this role three years ago. So very grateful. Thank you, Christina. That's a that's a really um, wonderful testimony to, you know, some of the skill development that you've personally, the journey you've personally been on. And thank you so much for sharing it with us. Todd, I have another question for you. Um, I recall when when we first had our first discussion with you know with you as mayor of North Perth, asking if we could work with your recreation team and and the council to establish a lonely no more program in your community. And so we've done that now. And I'm hoping you can share a bit about the reason for that initial request, what brought you to us, um, and you know some, some of the highlights of the journey to get the program going, and um, maybe wrap up with how your community has invested in sustaining the service. Thanks. Um, yeah, it. You know what? Um, I entered the political arena in the summer of 2018 and began knocking on doors. I was a relative newcomer to my community and uh, and nobody knew who I was. So just a, a strange new name uh, showing up on lawn signs kind of thing, right? And so um, as I was knocking on doors, I was quite profoundly affected by the number of isolated people that I met who at the door just would stand and 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 literally hold on to me to talk for 15 or 20 minutes and uh, it wasn't great for campaigning i can be honest about that uh, i couldn't be all that efficient some nights um, but it was great to sort of understand the reality of our community and how many people are isolated and lonely and struggling with uh, various uh, um, aspects of community engagement uh, so when I became mayor, certainly became quite attuned to the issue and um, I had the good fortune of attending um, a, 
a workshop session offered by the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture and Food Rural Affairs, um, and uh, I heard about Lonely No More as a sort of concept as it was emerging uh, at that time, and uh, immediately asked uh, our OMAF or Representative Vicky Laws if she wouldn't connect me to uh, Sheila and Sarah, and uh, thus began a, a fruitful collaboration. Um, you know, we we challenged, I think, uh, your organization in that uh, um, we wanted to bring it to North Perth and, and make it available to residents in North Perth. Um, it's not something I think that you had considered uh, in terms of partnering with the municipal government to that point, but uh, there was the opportunity. And uh, I'm grateful that you worked with uh, the staff team at North Perth to, to work out the details, to, to sort of figure out how could this work. Um, I was certainly um, interested, you know, uh, I, I recognize that it would take council involvement. Um, I think we are the first municipal government to sort of embrace um, the program as an offering, if you will, uh, to our community uh, and to our citizens. And, um, you know, I, I guess I can say honestly that I'm, I'm kind of a busy mayor, or maybe it's more accurately a busy body mayor, um, uh, someone who really does want to build a community that is well and that is caring and engaged and gracious um, in its outlook on each other and, and, and creates a kindness that, that you know, ripples through our, our community and, and draws important things into our lives. So, you know, in looking at this, as I can say, honestly, it, it appeared to me as an obvious uh, engagement uh, opportunity and obvious enrichment opportunity for our community and, and uh, council um, you know, had to sort of wrap its hands around it because it was sort of a different way to deliver certain kinds of services. Uh, um, but it, it worked. Council caught the vision and, and, uh, and um, you know, this in a community that at times uh, council can be very tough on the bottom line financially, um, but it saw in its wisdom to uh, uh, the, the value that this would bring and, and moved it forward. And um, we've continued. I think our, our original funding model has shifted a little bit, as I understand it. Um, I, I can't speak to the nuances of that. Um, but I can say that um, it's been great to work with um, with Sheila and Sarah on um, evolving this, um, they have brought to us additional opportunities. And and while we haven't really managed to pin any of them down, um, you know, we continue a dialogue about how can we do great things for for great and isolated people. And um, and so I'm sure that there will soon be other project opportunities with uh, uh, North Perth and the team uh, because. Um, you know, we're we're interested in that that innovation and in providing that service. And 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 quite frankly, um, and maybe this is not um, uh, politically correct, but I'm a guy who likes to stick my hands in other people's pockets when it comes to money and uh, extract their money. And so uh, where there are funding opportunities, um, I'm I'm looking for them to benefit my community um, and in ways, as I described, that, that create um, wellness and and a sense of caring um, and engagement. So, um, I, you know, I, it's been a, 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 a interesting journey. It's been a very flexible journey, and and I appreciate that about um, about working with Sheila and Sarah as well. Is that um, uh, you know, as they hear ideas, they bring some to me. I, I bring some to them. I, I hope our staff team does as well, and uh, we wind up, uh, you know, creating something that. Um, is valuable and is making a difference in our community. Most definitely, Todd, thank you for that. Um, yeah, we we do have a very interesting kind of unit of service model for anyone else from another community saying, how can we do it? Um, feel, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, it's worked very well. I think it's an innovative sustainability model. So we're glad to discuss that in further detail offline. I know that we're uh, we probably have some questions in the q and I think I will turn it over to uh, Michelle and our, our moderator to and Jay to bring up any questions that we have not uh, answered through the presentation. Great. Uh, so there was one question um, that was asked in the Q&A about the, the working age. What's the upper limit, the lower limit, probably both in you know, the people you're meeting uh, and serving in Lonely No More, as well as those people who are participating in the connectedness coaching. 
So you're when you say working age, you're, you're meaning the you know the volunteers. Let's talk about those first. Okay. We're interested in peer volunteers, and we're kind of different in the fact that we say peer is anyone who understands the rural experience. So there is not an age cap on you volunteering, other than you need to be reliable and mature enough to kind of you know have these dialogues. So I would say you know. We've had, we've worked with the University of Waterloo and students, and so you know that that age range is where it probably begins, um, right up to. We've had we've had we've had um, uh, folks who have been part of the program, participants who've gone on to work and lead co lead the music group, um, or support the music group. So you know uh, that that goes right into participants transferring their knowledge. So I would say that. Um, and Sarah, please correct me because you are coordinator. You'll know more than me. But I would say that at the moment, mostly are you know mostly forty to to sixty would be our volunteer range of ages. Would I be right about that, Sarah? We've recently got a few more that are a bit younger than that, which is exciting to see, a bit closer to my age, um, which is really cool to see that intergenerational approach. But yes, you're right. On average, it's it's about that that range for sure. And then as far as program participants, uh, we, we say, you know, oh, it's real older adults. So we say 65 plus generally, but we don't turn anyone away. If you're rural and isolated and you're 57 and you think that we're going to be able to benefit you, in you come. So that kind of gives you a, an idea of, uh, of age range or are out for our outreach. And again, connectedness coach. Let me just talk about connectedness coaching too. That's open to any community member. We've had, we've actually piloted it with the University of Waterloo. Um, you know, looking at a lonely no more model potentially for those on the loneliness uh, index that are younger, because uh, that's quite a that's quite a concern for us as well. Uh, and you know, it was really well received. Um, you know, in some cases, some of the concept we've talked about. Are brand new to them because it's they're starting their life experience. So uh, yeah, that's open to any community member who wants to participate. At least it is at the moment. Yeah, and during our newcomer uh, customization, we were actually able to engage high schoolers as well. So uh, that's been really cool to be able to see, um, and even that give and take, being able to learn from them and and adjust um, our 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 program accordingly. Uh, so that's been really cool to be able to do that. That's right, good call, Sarah. And how, how does one go about volunteering? Well, how would they for best contact you? Absolutely. Um, so I think I'm I'm trying, attempting to put that in the chat, but that's a great question. Um, Jay, if it's not in the chat yet, please uh, please help me out doing uh, <laughs> to do that so that uh, there's many different ways to connect. Um, I've put in there our website if you wanted to learn a little bit more. Um, we also have our direct phone number and an email. So whatever method works best for you, please feel free to reach out. Um, that goes for anyone who's interested in, in volunteering or perhaps talking a little bit about how do I bring this to my community? Those are all great places to do that as well. And Sarah, I, I just I would like to add, it's okay. Um, that the training manual and other training materials for the Lonely No More program are exceptional. And so, you know, when you think of um, different ages of volunteers and participants, um, the manual just makes it uh, kind of seamless for people to get up to speed and, and to get into the program and, and becoming effective right away. And also we have the lovely peer support. So we partner up in the Lonely No More program so that um, our each, of our unique skills are uh, come to the table and we work as a team. So that's a really awesome way to volunteer. Thanks for that, Christina. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, this was, this has been absolutely fantastic. Um, I want to say thank you, Sheila and Sarah and Christina and Todd for all your insight and your stories and for, creating these tremendously important programs like it's a beautiful example of how you take solid research and put it as action that is really doable in our rural communities so thank you i want to say a huge thank you to our sponsors for their continued support without them this lecture series would not be possible 
They include CIBC Private Wealth Management, DeJager Town Square IDA Pharmacy in Godridge, Zares of Godridge, the Town of Godridge, Libro Credit Union, McEwen and Fagan Insurance of Godridge, McKee Motors in Godridge. Gateway Center of Excellence in Rural Health is a not-for-profit organization with charitable status, and we greatly appreciate and welcome the support we receive. And if you would like to donate to Gateway in support of this lecture series or other activities that Gateway undertakes, I encourage you to visit the Gateway website and click on that donate button. Um, to learn more about Gateway's um, research projects or other programs or activities or to view missed lecture series sessions, browse our website, which is a pretty simple website, Gateway Rural Health, no spaces, .ca. We also sell high quality Gateway branded merchandise and clothing. So it's part of our one fundraising endeavor. So while you're on the website, check out that online store. Uh, and thank you again to all of you for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you at the next lecture series, which is on May 2nd at 12 noon Eastern. And when we will have a panel of qualified experts, um, they're going to discuss the threats of scams. Uh, you don't wanna miss this lecture. This is uh, very current and, and helpful. And so please pass this lecture series information along to your network, professional and social because our goal is to expand the reach of this lecture series with the aim of promoting knowledge, the knowledge economy, reducing social isolation and supporting Gateway's mission of improving the health and quality of life of rural residents. So see you next month, everyone. Stay well and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, everyone.